Hello, <laughs> welcome. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us and tuning in. My name is Catherine Grau. I am the Community Partnership Manager at Queen's Museum and it's my pleasure to welcome you all this evening. It's my honor to introduce uh, this evening's program before Ridgewood Reservoir, a talk by Eric Sanderson presented by NYC H2O in conjunction with their community partnership exhibition called Ridgewood Reservoir for the 21st Century, which is currently on view at the Queens Museum. The exhibition traces 160 years of transformation of the Ridgewood Reservoir from its construction to its invaluable role today as a 50 acre open space in Highland Park. Situated around the historic watershed model at the Queens Museum, this exhibition includes photographs, maps, historic ephemera, and documentation of the past four years of NYC H2O stewardship and advocacy work, which has led to the historic environmental protection and preservation of the site. So please um, feel invited to visit the museum. The show will be open through August. Um, and the museum is currently offering free admission throughout the remainder of this year. Um, before I pass the floor to Matt Molina, who will give a proper introduction to Eric Sanderson, I just want to let everyone know um, that we will be collecting all your questions in our Q&A. So we have um, a Q&A box where you can leave questions throughout the program and we'll be addressing all questions at the end of the talk where we allocate um, a, a generous amount of time for a conversation and Q&A. So please feel free to make use of that feature. And if you have any questions about it, you can um, put questions in the chat, but for the Q&A questions, please use the Q&A function. Uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna pass it to Matt Molina, founder and director of NYC H2O, uh, who will introduce Eric. And I think you're muted, Matt. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I am Matt Molina, the director and founder of NYC H2O. For those of you who are not familiar with the Richard Reservoir, there's a picture of it as my backdrop. On behalf of NYC H2O, I'd like to thank the Queens Museum for inviting us to curate the exhibit about the Richard Reservoir as part of their community partnership program. The exhibit, as Catherine noted, is called Ridgewood Reservoir for the 21st Century and is currently on display at the museum now through the end of July. Uh, we invite everyone to, to, to check it out. I'd like to uh, thank my co-curator, Robin Lynn, for her enormous help <clears throat> putting the exhibit together and to Catherine who um, uh, for her helpful guidance um, when we were putting it together as well. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Peter Frischauf and Catherine Rice, Alex and Paul Herzon, city council members, Robert Holden, Dharma Diaz <clears throat> and Antonio Reynoso and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs for their support in putting it together. For those of you, of you who are new to NYC H2O, we provide environmental education programs and stewardship of parks all around the city, especially at the Ridgewood Reservoir. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Eric Sanderson. Eric is a conservation ecologist at the Wildlife Conservation Society based in New York City. He is the author of the best-selling Manhattan, A Natural History of New York City published in 2009 by Abrams Publishing Company. He's now working on its sequel to be called Before New York, and it will be a two volume work. First, a detailed atlas about the, the pre-European environment of all five boroughs. Um, and that will be published also by Abrams Books in 2023, followed by a book to, an accomp to accompany the atlas. In 2019, Eric was selected by the New York Public Library's Coleman Center for a prestigious research fellowship. It is here where he did much of the research and developed ideas for his new work, 
and in part, the material for which his presentation is based on tonight. And just last week, this is exciting, he was selected by the Guggenheim Foundation for a research fellowship in geography and environmental studies to finish writing his new, his new book in Atlas. So he's no dummy. Please join me in welcoming Eric Sanderson. Eric. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Matt. Well, I think it's for the audience to decide if I'm a dummy or not, but I, I do appreciate that opening. Um, so uh, I'm going to share my screen with everybody. Um, hope you all can see a map. Maybe Matt, can you see a map or a yes. satellite image of, of Queens? Um, this presentation is a lot about geography, so I thought it'd be good to, to start with um, the place we're talking about, which is um, oops. Ridgewood Reservoir, which is right here. Um, you can actually see a little bit of the, the open reservoir. And, um, and of course, the exhibition is over here in, in, at the Queens Museum in Flushing Meadows. So, and we're looking down uh, from a satellite, looking at uh, Queens and Brooklyn with Manhattan over here and Jamaica Bay down here. And, um, and you know, for most of us who live in New York City, this is, this is the way we experience the city as a, a city of um, streets and buildings and infrastructure and port facilities and the airport over here, and then cemeteries and parks. Um, but this is only one, actually one very special snapshot of the landscape. The landscape hasn't been like this forever by any means. Um, in fact, the more and more I think about this, I just realize um, what a unique, special, and completely unconventional uh, view of this landscape that we all live in. Um, and that's what I want to try and hope to share with you tonight. Um, you know, the Ridgewood Reservoir is a really beautiful place. I invite you all to, to go when you have a chance. Um, it's, a, it's a really good example of, of reusing infrastructure. Um, just starting my timer here. Just uh, of reusing infrastructure. In a way, it's like the High Line or you know, many neighborhoods in New York City that have gone through one use to another use to another use. Um, and now uh, in large part, thanks to the efforts of the Parks Department and, and groups like NYCH2O where volunteers spend a lot of time trying to restore this, we're seeing a, a new use of this old infrastructure, which is um, actually it's older use, which is for nature. And actually creating a place that's good for birds and for wildlife, um, as well as um, to rejuvenate the human spirit. Um, and, it, you know, like, like I say, NYCH2O puts in a lot of effort and their, their volunteers and staff do um, run events all the time. The New York City Parks has also made a lot of investments in, in Highland Park, which have made it a much uh, more pleasant place to go and to visit. Um, if you come to the exhibit, I imagine you'll learn a lot about the reason why Ridgewood Reservoir exists as a reservoir as part of the Brooklyn water system uh, built in the 19th century. This is uh, one of the um, plans. Um, and it was part of this, this, um, this uh, infrastructure, this uh, water system to try and bring water from what's now Nassau County and, and Queens through a series of pipes up to the Ridgewood Reservoir and then to feed into Brooklyn um, before Brooklyn was part of the, the larger New York City water system that gets its water from the Catskill and Delaware rivers. And so, you know, it was all about bringing water to, to wash your potatoes and clean your clothes and to, and to, and to drink. Um, but that's just, again, you know, a very, very short period of time. I know it feels like it's a long time, 145 years, but there's so much more time that comes before that. I mean, you know, for example, the reason originally that reservoir was supposed to be on Mount Prospect, which is where the Brooklyn Museum is. That's actually the, the highest point on the line of hills. Um, but they actually were able to buy a, a cornfield, not this particular cornfield. This is another farm in Brooklyn. And, and, you know, for several hundred years, most of Brooklyn and Queens looked like this. It was farm fields with uh, horses and fences and barns. Um, also, interestingly, there was a, a lake right beside the place where the Ridgewood Reservoir is. This lake doesn't exist anymore. It was filled in in the, in the mid 20th century. Um, but Banzer's Lake, which was an old, um, old kettle pond, which, um, which we'll talk about, a sort of perch pond on top of the moraine. And it's called Banzer. Banzer owns an amusement park. And that's what you see here in this picture from the Queens Library. Um, uh, somebody on a high tightrope walking across Banzer Lake to the entertainment of everybody else who was there. Um, if you look a little bit deeper into history, of course, you learn that um, 
the the line of hills, the moraine that the Ridgewood Reservoir sits on top of, was very important in the American Revolution, especially in the Battle of Brooklyn in August of 1776. And just down the hill, there was another little pond um, in what's now the Cemetery of the Evergreens, where there was a, a lookout tree where the British used to, to look out for revolutionaries and keep keep things keep things under control in Queens. Um, but I want to talk to you about a history that comes all before that. Um, to starting with the research that we've been doing for the last 20 years on the historical ecology of New York City right before Henry Hudson arrived in 1609. And this is an image that one of my colleagues produced of, um, of Brooklyn Heights. So we're looking at Brooklyn Heights um, uh, and looking east. And you can see in the distance the line of hills where the, whoops, where the Ridgewood Reservoir is today. So this will be our starting point tonight. And then we're gonna go further back in time from there. Um, so let me just say a little bit about um, what, what I'm at. And um, you know, one of the things that I really came to appreciate when I was at the library is the importance of names. And, um, and particularly this guy, I, I don't know if anybody knows who this guy is, but this is uh, James Duke of York. Uh, this is why we call the city New York because this is the old York. This is the, the guy that we're named after. He, he was the um, brother of King Charles II of England in the, in the 17th century. And his brother uh, in 1664 gave, gave James a letter. And this letter said, James, um, by my divine right, you now own all the land between the Delaware River and the Connecticut River and New England and Maine. So go and get it. And so James fitted out a warship and sent some of his um, some of his men across the Atlantic, and they came up to the Dutch fort that was in Lower Manhattan, and they said, "This is all ours." And the Dutch, because they weren't prepared, said, "Okay, it's yours." And they that's that's when New Netherland became New York, and uh, this is relevant to us because, of course, when we talk about Brooklyn or Kings County, the king is King Charles II, and the queen is uh, Catherine of Braganza from Portugal here. So Queens is actually remembering Catherine of Portugal. And I know, I don't think there's anybody on this call or anybody on this Zoom webinar that thinks when they say Brooklyn or Kings County that they're thinking of King Charles or when they think Queens, they're thinking of, of the Princess uh, Braganza. Or in fact, when we say the city of New York or the New York Public Library, or we pay our taxes to New York State that we're thinking of James, Duke of York. And yet their ideas about the land and their ideas about the people and the wildlife on that land are still deep inside the American idea, still deep in the side of New York City. And so in a way, part of my work is trying to, um, to uh, get underneath those old ideas and to create a new idea to, in some sense, to, to open the curtain as the Duke is doing and see what, what lies beyond in the landscape, to lift the curtain, if you like. And that's really what this Wilikia project is all about. Um, so I'm gonna to talk to you just to, just to give you a little bit of context about what, what I've been trying to do, um, and then talk to you about wood, ridge, and reservoir, and how these, um, these ideas can take us back into a, a deeper time, and also I hope a, a new appreciation of what it means to, to be a New Yorker. So you know, one of the things we do is we use historical maps and we geo-reference them like this. So this is a, a map from the 19th century and I've overlaid it on top of it, the streets and buildings of New York City today. And um, by doing this kind of geo-referencing in the computer, we can then pull information from the maps and then use that to build other maps that tell us not just about the landscape at the time the map was made, but tell us something about the landscape before that. So this is, um, these are the forests and wetlands, for example, on Hassler's map of 1844. Um, Here's you know, some, some of the bathymetry, the depths under the water. Um, we can get a shoreline from this map and from many, many maps. And you have to know, you know what they meant by the shoreline. You know, is it the high tide or the mean high tide or the low tide? Um, and you have to know when the map was made so that you can actually adjust for sea level rise um, as shown on this, this plot here. This is a sea level rise in New York City over the last uh, 200 years. And then we do this not just for any one map, but for many, many maps. Um, for those of you that have followed my work on 
um, Manhattan and Manhattan. You know, Manhattan, we had kind of one map that did a, did most of the work. It was that, that amazing British headquarters map from the American Revolution. Um, but for the Wilikia project, which is covering all five boroughs in New York City, we've had to use literally hundreds of maps and digitize tens of thousands of features as shown here. Um, really a, a mammoth amount of work and not, not work that I've done on, alone. I've had many, many students and volunteers and uh, professional staff and helpers over the years. More than 90 people have contributed to the project in one way or another. Um, and from these, the, all this work, we can um, synthesize a view of the landscape, not for any one of those times, but actually projecting back from that information to, uh, to 1609, to the, the year Henry Hudson arrived. That's sort of our, uh, the time we're looking at. Not because we're trying to say anything great about Hudson, but, but you know, the Hudson moment has been thought of as sort of the mythological beginning of New York City for well, most of the last 400 years. And so, you know, the question is what was there right before? Um, here's Ridgewood Reservoir again, as you can see. Um, and then, you know, New York City has this kind of funny shape, sort of triangular. And so actually we decided a couple of years ago to expand out uh, to 30, about a 30 kilometer circle like this. Um, so we can see the city in the round. So this is this map here is showing the topography of the city. The um, yellow and brown colors are showing you the upland topography and the, the blue colors are showing you the pathimetry, the depths under the water. And we'll talk a lot more about them, um, about how this landscape came to be. Um, there are many layers involved. We know we also um, composite layers of the streams and the springs and all the ponds. Um, we map all the wetlands, the salt marshes, the tidal marshes, which were quite extensive, particularly, particularly in Jamaica Bay and uh, Flushing Meadows, for example, where the museum is, um, but also freshwater wetlands, which were quite extensive across the city. Um, and we pay a particular attention to the Lenape people, to the indigenous people of New York City. And uh, each of the little black dots on the map here represents a uh, specific either archeological site or historical site. Um, some places we have information of both about um, Lenape people living there uh, in either even in the wood, late woodland period, so right before contact or right right after contact. Um, and there's a trail network here in the dotted lines, which is um, which is nobody really knows what the trail network was, but this is our best guess of what it might have been based on other research people have done. So, and then uh, accompanying to this, we, we keep track of all the, the data. You can imagine for a project that lasts 20 years, you need to have some method of not losing stuff. And um, so my colleague, Kim Fisher has helped uh, just so tremendously to build these databases that allow us to track all the information um, and to, to make sure that we don't lose, lose things that are important, lose the bibliographic information and so forth. And also to help track the place names um, so the maps are really helpful and useful for seeing the whole geography, but of course the, the naming history is also important. And it, the naming history actually allows you then to connect to the uh, textual sources. And so, you know, me and my students and helpers have spent a lot of time, you know, reading the old literature on New York City. There's nothing from 1609, it's all after 1609. So the idea is you read, you know, some account from the 19th century, and then you're looking for the description of the stream or the, the height of the hill or, you know, where somebody saw this, this bird or this kind of wildlife. And then we document that in this, um, in this database. And that allows us then to actually name the streams and the hills um, across the whole city. And this has been a, a massive piece of work, much, much more, <laughs> much harder and much longer than I thought when I first started it. Um, uh, you know, cause there's multiple names. Often there's a Lenape name um, sometimes, you know, and then there'll be a Dutch name and then there'll be an English name and sometimes there'll be multiple English names over time. Um, so, and then we, we also use pictures. We use images like this painting of, um, from Victor Gifford Audubon of the Hudson River um, or, you know, photography, um, historical photography, or, and sometimes we can actually go and take pictures of places that still exist and, um, and then talk about the changes. So, you know, fortunately, uh, New York City has a very extensive parks uh, system with many, many natural areas in it. I mean, we're, it's so fortunate that, that the, these have been spared over the years. And um, there's a real effort to sort of bring them back and to restore them. Uh, and then finally, we combine all of this in a modeling approach using something we, we invented called mirror webs, which allows you to draw habitat connections between plants and animals and between the, the living and non-living parts of the environment. 
that allows you to represent it as a, a network diagram like this, but even more importantly, allows you to, um, to represent it as a series of maps. So each of the different points on this uh, diagram represents a different plant or animal or stream type or soil type. And each of the gray lines represents a connection between that thing and something else in the network. And you can see just what a tremendously diverse um, and, and uh, densely uh, connected network it is. And this is exactly what gives nature its resilience. Um, because, you know, you, you might, you know, one of, the, one, of these, one of these might break. Um, so if you depended only on one other thing in the, in the mirror web, that would be a problem. And so, you know, species over time, um, and in some sense, you know, nature over time has, has sort of um, spread its bets and requires multiple dependencies. And I actually think there's a, a fascinating kind of parallel between the resilience of cities as dense, highly interconnected networks and, uh, and the way nature works. So, all right, so let's come back to uh, the Ridgewood Reservoir, which um, I'm zoomed in a little bit here so you can see how it, it sits right in the middle of this, this sort of green complex along the edge of the Jack, Jackie Robinson Parkway. Um, it's mostly, mostly cemeteries, but then Highland Park here in the middle. And uh, let's, let's look at some of the layers for this, this place. Um, so for example, the topography. So you can see it's actually the Ridgewood Reservoir, not surprisingly, is sited on the top of a hill. Um, that, that was for good reason, because they wanted to use gravity to, to, to serve the water down to Brooklyn to the west. Um, we'll talk some more about that. Um, the, the geology of this landscape has to do a lot with the last glacier, and I'll, I'll describe that in some more detail. It sits on top of the terminal moraine, which I'm sure many of you are aware. But it means that um, as you come this direction, this glacial outwash stratified drift, this is the result of, of materials flowing out of the glaciers 20,000 years ago. And behind this, it was a landscape uh, completely different, one that was impacted by the ice of uh, 20,000 years ago. Um, and then of course, from these soils and these topographic conditions and some uh, more information about the vegetation, you get the distribution of soils. We're mapping about uh, 200 different soil types across the whole city. Um, we're also, as I mentioned, mapping the hydrology. So, so actually, you know, if, you, if we were to look at an area the same size in uh, the Bronx or Staten Island or Manhattan, there would be many, many more streams than there are in this area. There's actually very few streams. That has to do with the, um, with the, the soils and the subsurface geology of, of Long Island that most of the water goes right down into the aquifer. Um, and then it gets released in the low points to these streams that then feed these tidal creeks here. And the exception to that are all these ponds. So these are all ponds that we've uh, found on various historical maps, including at Banzer's Lake right here. Um, and these are, these are um, mostly these sort of perched water table ponds, ponds that were left because the glaciers left a, a little bit of clay in the bottom that created the improbial surface. And so these are sort of perched up above the main water table. And, um, and not connected by a series of streams like you might find in other parts of the city. It's actually kind of a, a new, unique part of the ecology here. And of course, the Lenape. So there was um, there were a couple of Lenape sites, most a whole large number of Lenape sites along Jamaica Bay. Almost all the Lenape sites in the city um, are associated either with, either with a stream or with the shoreline for, for good reason, because they got a lot of food out of the ocean. Um, and for fishing. Um, this site back here is called the Clam Battery, and it's a, a place that was excavated in the 19th century. And they dug down deep and found a whole series of, of clam shells. Um, and again, these trails, don't take these trails too seriously. You know, people have spent a lot of time trying to reconstitute the trail system, um, but there's very, very little historical information about where they were. Um, but of course, using these kind of topographic maps, we can see where would be the reasonable places to, um, to cross the moraine, for example. So, and then all of these then result in these maps of the different ecosystem types. And I, I can't, <laughs> I'm really struggling actually to make a map that has all the colors for all the communities because there, there are actually so many. So I'm just going to highlight a couple um, as I talk about the, the woods in Ridgewood. So if we were, if we were walking in, on the terminal moraine 400 years ago, we would have been walking in a coastal oak hickory forest. Um, that's that's be the modern description of it, but this is also the forest that was dominated in the past by chestnuts. So this would have been an oak, chestnut, um, and hickory kind of forest. And um, 
And then if in the valley bottoms around it, you would have found this oak tulip tree kind of forest, which, um, which is on, on the edges and, and prefers a little bit wetter, wetter conditions. And um, it, you know, it might've looked something like this, um, except that the trees would have been much bigger, <laughs> uh, much bigger. And the understory probably would have been more open because the Native Americans would light fires to, to try and keep it open. And um, a part of the project is actually trying to model that, that sense of fire. Um, and you know, this again is an area of a, a great deal of sort of scholarly um, controversy. And again, because we just don't have very much information about it. Um, but a, a student of mine and I wrote a paper um, a decade or so ago where we actually tried to figure out how the landscape would respond to different fire frequencies um, and how, how many times you would have to burn it to open up the landscape. Um, just to mention these chestnut trees. So, you know, chestnut trees were probably half of the basal area of the forests of New York City once upon a time. This particular one, this is an extraordinary example that survived into the, into the 19th century. This is uh, the Lord Howe chestnut in, from Pelham, New York, not very far from, from where I live uh, here on City Island. Um, some of these trees in the right conditions would grow to just enormous size. Um, and they're very productive in terms of of dropping chestnuts, also the oaks and the hickories, you know, these are all nut producing trees. So they're such an important part of the, of the heart of the wildlife. Um, and then unfortunately the a blight was introduced in the early 20th century. And now these, they still persist in the, in the forest but they only grow up to be kind of a, a shrub. They get to about 20 years old and then they, and then they get this fungus and then they, they die back. Um, so, but in the past they were such an important part of the forest and there's some, some speculation that they were really important for um, the distribution of passenger pigeons, for example. And then these beautiful oak tulip tree forests, um, which again, again, you know, probably there would have been a more open understory. Um, big, tall, thin trees, these tulip trees, Liriodendron uh, tuliparifer, they're, they're kind of a special tree of the Northeast. They're in the Magnolia family. And um, they were called canoe wood for a long time. Um, the Lenape would, would, when these were down near the shore, would cut them because they would be so long and straight and this, the wood is relatively soft. So you can make these big dugout canoes. And we have, you know, historical descriptions of dugout canoes that are 20, 28 feet long with, with many, many different people uh, rowing them. So which is just to say, you know, the Lenape were part of the landscape. Um, it's, it's really important to remember that people have been in the New York City landscape for 8,000 years or more and probably multiple cultures over that time. Um, the Lenape or an Algonquin speaking people. Um, that, and some of the other cultures that are Algonquin speaking in the Northeast refer to them as the ancient ones. Um, they lived all across New York City um, and then down across New Jersey and into Eastern Pennsylvania. And all the evidence is they had a pretty great life. Um, lots of food, you know, lots of seafood, re shellfish resources, clams and oysters. Um, Lots of deer and other, other game to hunt, lots of uh, plants to gather. And um, they did a kind of soft ecosystem management using, using fire. Um, and they also grew their own food. They would grow these gardens of corn, beans, and squash. Probably not at Ridgewood Reservoir. Again, they would be more close to the coast. Um, so, and then the other, other important ecosystem that would have been up here at Ridgewood Reservoir would have been these ponds, particularly um, Banzer's Lake here. And um, one of the interesting things about these um, perched uh, water table ponds that aren't connected to streams is they probably didn't have any fish. I mean, rarely fish, you know, well, it's amazing, but fish eggs sometimes get stuck on duck feet and then the duck fly from pond to pond. And then that's how, that's how fish can get into a pond. But probably most of these ponds didn't have, um, didn't have any fish in them, which would have meant they were awesome for amphibians. Um, like these tree frogs and these spring peepers. And uh, whenever I think of tree frogs, I always think of this quote from um, Peter, Kalm, Peter Kalm, who was visiting in the 18th century and took a walk up through Greenwich Village and, and noted in his diary that the tree frogs are so loud that it was difficult for a, for a man to make himself heard. I see I mistyped that. For a man to make himself heard. <laughs> um, and actually I have, um, let's see if this works. I have, uh, I have. I have some uh, frog song for you because it's it's that time of year. So let me know if you can hear this. <laughs> 
let's uh, just just meaning to give you a little a little idea of the beautiful sounds of spring um, of the past around uh, around the Ridgewood Reservoir. Um, uh, something else I just wanted to mention in, in this context is you know each of these each of these three species and we can talk about many other species you know has its own evolutionary history and its own path to get into New York City. So. Um, uh, chestnuts, the, the genus Castanea, um, it seems to be involved in, in Asia some 85 to 60 to 85 million years ago. Um, and then maybe it came across the Bering Land Strait uh, into, into North America. So they, they've actually were on this landscape for a really long time. And though they're still here, they're, they're really suffering uh, now. And you compare that, so that's a long time ago, 80, 65 to 85 million years ago. And I'm going to, in some of the later slides, so you're going to use this convention of BP to mean before present, so years before present. So, so imagine that. That's a long time ago. I mean, in contrast, you know, human beings, our species, Homo sapiens, is about 200,000 years ago, and we evolved in Africa. And so to get to, to, for the Lenape people, for example, to get to New York, their ancestors, you know, had to leave Africa, you know, get all the way across to Asia, find the Bering Land Strait, come all the way into North America, and then work their way all the way across North America to get to, get to where we, uh, to where New York City is. Um, and then interestingly, this um, gray tree frog, uh, Hyla versicolor, it's actually a quite recent evolution. This, there's just some, been some recent papers about this that, um, you know, most, most, um, most vertebrates have two copies of the DNA in each spell, in each of their cells. But it turns out that this particular species has four copies. It's a tetraploid. Um, some plants are also tetraploid and a few snakes. But it's, a rel it's relatively rare in vertebrates that you see this. And there's another tree frog, the Copes tree frog, that looks exactly the same, but it calls it, a, it, calls it twice the rate. And, um, and that difference in the call led scientists to, to wonder if there was maybe a different species. So they did the genetics. And it turns out that the difference is the number of copies of the DNA um, in each cell, for the chromosomes, and that actually happened in the post-glossal period. So actually, this is the this is the youngest one of the three of us. Um, and then you know, just take, keep in a, just just you know, pause for a minute and think like, you know, some things take twenty thousand years to happen, others take two hundred thousand years to happen, and then some things take millions of years to happen. And yet, if we were walking around in uh, April of sixteen oh nine. We might have seen all three of these things all all right in the same place. So let's uh, let's go back a little further in time and talk about the vegetation a little bit. So, you know, we've been saying that 400 years ago maybe it was uh, coastal okikiri forest here, um, but of course there was other vegetation types before that. You know, the um, at the height of the last glaciation, all the oaks that, that we know today were down in Georgia, and they actually had to migrate as the glaciers migrated to get back up to where we are. Um, and that's reflected in the pollen. So this is, a, this, uh, this is from a, a paper summarizing some of the pollen analysis data. And so 400 years ago, you might have seen uh, oak chestnut. But if you go back uh, 11,000 years ago, you would have seen pine forest in the Ridgewood Reservoir. So like the, this is a pine forest in Connecticut, but this is the kind of forest you would have seen. And if you were to go back 18,000 years ago, you would have found tundra and spruce and jack pine like this, like you have to go to Canada to see nowadays. That would have been the vegetation around the Ridgewood Reservoir. So just think about that. And, and of course, each of these, each of these ecosystems, just like you know, our kind of modern neighborhoods, you know, it they have different species associated with them. You can't, you know, if you can make your living in an oak chestnut forest, it doesn't mean you can make your living in a pine forest. And just because you could live in a pine forest doesn't mean you can live in a spruce forest. You know, each of these has their you know, it's not just the trees, but it's all the other associated uh, plants and animals. Um, which gets us to this question of the ridge in Ridgewood. So, you know, we, uh, I mentioned before that, um, you know, the Ridgewood Reservoir is on the terminal moraine from the last glaciation. So a moraine is the hill that's left, um, left by a glacier. And the terminal moraine is the last moraine. It's the one that marks the furthest uh, extent south the glacier extended. And you can actually see that terminal moraine very clearly in this uh, 1609 topographic map, you know, coming all the way across uh, Queens and Brooklyn, crossing over here to Staten Island and going all the way down here. And actually it would turn and go back up this way in, in what's now New Jersey. Um, and in fact, you know, the glaciers are probably the most important thing uh, 
perhaps other than a bulldozer that have shaped the shaped the physical um, topography of New York City. Um, we, we call this last glaciation, the one that happened 20,000 years ago, the Wisconsin glaciation the Wisconsin glacier, the Wisconsin glaciation, because it used to be in Wisconsin. So, so we're over here, right? So there's the Redwood Reservoir. And you can see this, this line from the USGS sort of marks where the, the glaciers were, where the ice was. And not just here, but also in, um, in the Himalayas, there were glaciers, and of course in, in Russia. So this was a poleward, you know, from the North Pole kind of extension. And you notice that there were also these um, places behind the glaciers that were actually open, and these turned out to have become very important. The other thing that's really important to say about when the glaciers are here is that um, there's so much water locked up in the fresh water in the ice that's on, on land that the sea level is actually much, much lower. And um, so, you know, there's a lot of work now to reconstruct the pathways, the people and maybe wildlife moved not through the ice, but actually around the ice to get down here to the unglaciated portion. So um, this is a, a little <laughs> a, a set of maps to try and show you what that looked like in the New York City context. So, so just to remind you, so, so that's the 1609 uh, topography. This is the, the topography, my, my sort of best approximation of where it was at the height of the last glacial maximum about 21,000 years ago. So, um, oops. So, and I guess I left out my little marker, but you see right there, that's Ridgewood Reservoir. So. If we were 21,000 years ago, we were at the Ridgewood Red Reservoir, we would have been under ice. Not a lot of ice, because it was, it was much thicker as you go to the north. You know, it was 2,000 feet thick over Manhattan. Um, but here it might have been maybe 100 feet thick. And then just south of there, there wouldn't have been any ice. But what there would have been instead were massive rivers of material dumping, dumping out. That's what these arrows are trying to show. And they would have, we don't know exactly where these things were, but they would have been across here. And, and maybe some of these, um, you know, little valleys that you see in the topography are, are, you know, indications in the landscape of Queens and Brooklyn or Staten Island over here um, of where these, where, these, um, where these outflowing rivers might have been. And then you can see I've taken away the blue color from the oceans because, of course, the sea level was much, much lower. It was about 100 meters lower, which meant that where we are here at the Ridgewood Reservoir wasn't, you know, wasn't just a mile or two from the shore. It was literally 100 miles, 120 miles from the shore, right? So this entire landscape was, was well, this was a big valley, the lower harbor, you know, where we go boating nowadays. This was all a big harbor and you could have walked. And if you'd walked all the way out there, walked 100 miles through the tundra and across the spruce forest, and eventually you would have found the beach um, out on the coastal Atlantic plain. So this, this glacier was here for several thousand years and then it started to retreat. And uh, an interesting thing that happened is it started to retreat. Um, it started to form these lakes, these glacial lakes. And um, of course, the the moraine, as as you might have guessed, you know, was not just not just in Brooklyn and Queens and Staten Island. It was also across the Narrows, what we think of as the Verrazano Narrows, where the Verrazano Narrows bridges. There was a a dam. There was a moraineal dam there, which which backed up the water. And so this first glacial lake that formed, actually the release point was over here on the um, near between Perth Amboy and Ward's Point in Staten Island. That was the dam and the water had to release there. And then there was a river that came out this way across this valley and out toward, um, out toward the ocean. So, and the geologists call this glacial Lake Bayonne. And then if we go back, so that's about 19,500 years ago, years before present. Oops, sorry, if we go back, 19,000 years ago, the glaciers retreating to the north. Um, there was this other glacial lake, glacial lake Hackensack, and it actually was much, much higher, uh, glacial lake Hackensack, um, so much so that it was about, about um, six meters higher than modern sea level, which I don't know if you can tell. That means, you know, big parts of the lower part of Brooklyn and Queens and, and say where the museum is, they were all underwater, they're all flooded. And, um, and what, what controlled that water level was actually the, the Hellgate right here. And I, I need to make a better slide, but, but actually the ice, the ice made a dam right at Hellgate and it held up the water. And then one day it broke through and it broke through and this huge wave washed down and made a big waterfall at Hellgate, you know, off of Astoria Park. And then that flowed out south and filled the, the glacial Lake Connecticut that was out here in Long Island Sound. Um, 
and eventually that oh yeah I forgot to show that. That's that. That's exactly the place. And actually, if you look at the if you look at the modern underwater bathymetry, you can actually still see these sort of series of waterfalls that are are now you know covered by the seawater by the water of the East River. But to mark the the water falling down and falling down and falling down through great with great force. So eventually, the water kind of drained away out this way. Um, so the Hudson River, if you want to call it that, but it's not. I don't know if that's really the right name because it was. I don't know. 18,000 years before Hudson, <laughs> it was a long time before him. But anyway, the, the water would drain out this way from the glacier and then go around like this through what's our East River and then out this way through Long Island Sound in order to get to the ocean. And eventually, of course, it drained all away. And, um, and this glacial lake, this glacial lake is called Glacial Lake Albany because it extended all the way up to Albany, right? And, um, and eventually that, that broke. There was a series of glacial lakes further north, and about 16,500 years ago, they broke, and this massive wall of water came flooding down the Hudson River uh, Valley and through and broke out this dam and created the Verrazano Narrows as we know it today. And there's, there's a paper that was written about a decade ago that suggests that it was so much fresh water that it actually changed the Gulf Stream for a few years. And the, you know, the Gulf Stream is actually very important for the climate of, of the North Atlantic. So it might have affected the weather in Europe, this, this incident here. If you're familiar at all with the Scablands in Eastern Washington state, there's a similar story there, um, which is really, which is often told and kind of a classic example of this. But the same thing happened here in New York. We just don't remember because eventually the ocean came in and filled it all up. And uh, you know, so I, now I, you know, it's given me kind of a new appreciation when I look at these old lithographs of the Narrows. So this is Brooklyn over here in Staten Island. And you can see just how narrow it is and actually how you can easily imagine that there was, you know, a land, a natural land bridge, not the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, but a natural land bridge that, that covered this thing. Anyway, so to go back to the Ridgewood Reservoir site, so, you know, you had all this ice and all this water and all this sediment flowing out of that, flowing out of that ice. And what did it flow across? It flowed across tundra. So this is what you know Brooklyn might have looked like at the time, um, you know, just just like if you would go to Alaska or up to the glaciers today, you would have seen this you know very low vegetation uh, adapted for the cold, and then you know all these rocks, and then and then the rivers flowing across it. And uh, what would have lived in that tundra? What would have lived on that tundra? I'm sure you're wondering. Well, mastodons. <laughs> there was actually I don't know if you know this, but when they um, were ex excavating the Springfield Pond reservoir um, as part of the Brooklyn water system, they actually found bones, some teeth of uh, American mastodon. And there's another site on Staten Island where the same thing was found. Um, so there were mastodons in, in New York City. Um, and I found this, this image on the web, although I, I was reading a little later that, that now people aren't so sure how furry they were. You know, mammoths were certainly furry. Mastodons are a different, a different species and maybe they weren't quite as furry. Um, but you can imagine that there were Brooklyn, there were there were mastodons walking around in, in Brooklyn and Queens once upon a time. And uh, also caribou. So we would have had caribou. So the same way that the plant, the vegetation communities would move around depending on the climate and the topographic conditions. So, so would the wildlife, um, which is just to say that, you know, every species that you've ever met is trying to do exactly the same, your, same thing you're doing, which is trying to have the best life possible and trying to take every opportunity to to make their living. And, um, and that meant that we would have had such diverse and amazing wildlife um, in the past. And this is kind of what the landscape would have looked like then. Say, say we were to back you know, 8,000 years when human beings first got here, when the ancestors of the ancestors of the ancestors of the Lenape came to the New York City landscape. They would have found a landscape more like this, a sort of boreal landscape of ponds and lakes and um, and uh, low trees like this. And they would have hunted with uh, paleo points. They would have been hunting mastodons with paleo points in New York City. So finally, let's just talk a little bit about the, uh, the reservoir of Ridgewoods. So, um, so I mentioned these, um, these ponds, uh, these ponds that were, were up here. Um, they were perched above the water table, but the main water table of Long Island, which, which the water table that actually the Brooklyn um, Waterworks was really designed to capture is the is the aquifers. You know, when people first moved, when Europeans first moved to Brooklyn, the way they got their water most mostly was from wells. They would dig a well, and you could find water not very deep. 
um, because Brook, uh, Long Island has this amazing um, aquifer system, which I'll talk about a little bit now. So, so this is a this is a diagram from a a paper published uh, back in 2007 by some USGS scientists on Long Island, and uh, what it's showing. So let me draw this line. So you see this white line here. This is basically coming from Astoria across through the Ridgewood Reservoir, across Jamaica Bay and out to the ocean. So that's that's a, a profile, which is essentially like the x-axis here. So, so you see it starts at the East River and then the the Y scale here is, is very um, exaggerated. So they they have this big here, the Ronkonka Moraine, that's the terminal moraine we've been talking about and then Jamaica Bay and, and the Atlantic Ocean, right? So as we go this way to this way, it's like we're moving like this way to this way. And what this is showing is the bedrock is actually really deep that it falls off. That if you imagine, imagine Long Island, it, the bedrock isn't flat, it's actually tilted and it's tilted up. It's tilted up so that it's very close to sea level at the East River. And you can actually see this in a few places in Brooklyn and Queens that right over by the East River, they're actually bedrock that's, that's exposed. But by the time you get out to the airport and out to Jamaica Bay, it's, um, it's you know 400 meters deep, deep. it's 1200 feet under the surface. It's that, that uh, steep of an angle. And then what's lying on top of that um, is not just what the glaciers left, but what previous um, incursions have left, both, both glacial materials, but also from the sea coming in and out. And so that's, that's what you're showing here. You have these um, impermeable layers, this what's called the gardener's clay and this raritan confining unit. And what they're doing is they're confining these aquifers. So an aquifer, an aquifer in this sense is, is our um, sediments like sands and uh, sands and maybe rocks that allow the water to move in there. And then the clay puts it under pressure and hold, holds it there. So if you wanted to get water, you'd have to you know, drill, you know, dig your well down. If you get to a certain, certain depth, you're in this upper glacial aquifer. This is the recent stuff. But if you, got, if you permeate this gardener's clay, you get into this um, Jamaica aquifer. And if you go even deeper, you can get down to this Lloyd aquifer. And you know, Queens, uh, especially the Eastern part of Queens used to get a lot of its waters, um, even up until the 1970s um, from, from the aquifer. So much so that um, that actually it lowered the aquifer quite considerably, which is actually why this research was conducted. Um, and then once the whole city became part of the New York City water system, um, that, that aquifer has been rising. And now, you know, in Southeast Queens, there's a lot of trouble with people's basements flooding and um, street flooding when it rains hard. Anyway, so, so you know, what's the, my question is, so that's where the water is. Um, where do these layers come from um, and how old are they? Um, and that's what this, what this diagram is supposed to show you. And I, I'm, I don't want you to have to read this, but, but, <laughs> but I, I, I do would like you to appreciate the, um, the ways that even scientists sometimes cross scale quite suddenly. So the upper part of this diagram is about the quaternary period, which is the last two and a half million years um, of history on earth. And, um, and that's where these different layers are. The gardener's clay is here. It's, um, maybe a million years old. The Jamaica gravel is a bit older than that. Um, and then the other layers, the lower ones, these, this, um, this raritan confining unit here is actually of Cretaceous age. And the Cretaceous is 65 to 145 million years ago. This is the, the time that we associate with the dinosaurs. And then the other thing about this diagram that just kills me is uh, it says just in little simple letters, unconformity, unconformity. And what that means is those are huge chunks of time where they don't know what, what the hell happened because the geological material just doesn't exist anymore. It was eroded away and so it doesn't exist. And that's how you're able to jump from something that was two and a half million years ago to something that was 65 million years ago. Um, and the only way you can figure out what's going on here is to look at the sort of bigger picture, what's looking at what's going on around, um, around uh, the Ridgewood Reservoir, around, around the site. Um, and to that end, um, we're getting close to the end here, but I just wanted to, to show you this, this diagram of temperature. You know, scientists have been working so hard because of climate change to chart not just the current climate, but try and figure out what the past climate was like. And um, this diagram is again, one of these crazy cross scale sorts of things where the, the scale over on this end is measured in thousands of years. In this middle section is in hundred thousands of years. And then over here is in millions of years, singles of millions of years, tens of millions of years, 
and then hundreds of millions of years. And what they're trying to do is make a diagram that you can actually put on a, a single slide or a piece of paper that shows you how has the global temperature changed over the last 540 million years. So in the, in the Cambrian era, this is basically the era when, when life exploded um, 540 million years ago, the Cambrian explosion as it's called. And so, you know, you can see, so <laughs> this, this period for the last 10,000 years, that's called the Holocene. That's the, that's the time when civilization started, right? We, we, human beings started agriculture approximately 10,000 years ago, 12,000 years ago. And you can see over here, it's just up against the edge. That's modern climate change. That's, that's what everybody's so worried about over here. And then if you go back this direction, well, you can see, well, there's the last glacial maximum 20,000 years ago. And you can see that actually that was really cold. Uh, over the last 540 million years, that was a really cold time. And then in the Pleistocene, in the, mil the million years that came before that, you have these glacials and interglacials. So it wasn't like the Wisconsin glaciation was a one-time event. There were many, many glaciers um, uh, that happened. You know, there was these five or six over the last uh, sort of 500 million years, as you can see. So the higher temperatures are interglacial periods where, where the glaciers retreat. And then these lower ones are where the glaciers um, uh, expand. And then bef after that, before the Pleistocene, what you have is, you know, um, much higher temperatures back, back over here in the, in the Eocene, like 50 million years ago, that was one of the warmest times on earth. And the temperature was four, on average 14 degrees more than what the average temperature was between 1960 and 1990. And that finally brings us back to the Cretaceous, which is this, um, what's going on right here, these orange ones. And you can see how the temperature is going up and down. And that is associated with massive changes in the sea level. Um, so much so that if we were to go back to the time when the uh, dinosaurs were here in the late Cretaceous, the sea level in New York City was about 150 um, meters higher than it is today. And 150 meters higher than it is today is, is the entire city, um, which means that if we were back in the Ridgewood Reservoir uh, 65 million years ago, it would have looked something like this, minus the sailboat. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been underwater. <laughs> the whole city would have been underwater. And in fact, it was the, you know, the, the movement in of these oceans and then their retreat over time that actually deposited those, um, those confining layers in the Raritan unit. Um, and, and because those layers extend across to New Jersey, um, uh, in New Jersey, you can actually sort of see the details of them. And so they've been sort of finely mapped and they can actually map the oceans coming in and coming out and coming in and coming out over, over millions of years. And as that happened, they find fossils. And so what would have been living in this ocean um, where the Ridgewood Reservoir was uh, 65 million years ago? Well, plesiosaurs, for example, <laughs> these long neck uh, carnivorous uh, dinosaurs uh, would have lived here. And, um, and what would have hunted those? Well, perhaps the Mosasaur, Mosasaurus, which was this just ginormous dinosaur a uh, carnivorous dinosaur. Um, and uh, I just want to close by, by, um, by sharing another video with you, um, which is my favorite part, probably the only part worth watching of, of uh, Jurassic World. Uh, okay, so that's a little silly, but it gets, it gets very effective in making the point. What a cool, cool creature um, to have lived in New York City. Um, so so I, I'm, I'm at time, so I'm going to stop. But um, There's so much more to say. We've only went back 65 million years. I mean, come on, the Earth is 4 billion years long. There's so much more to know and to talk about. There's so much more to the story of New York City. Um, and, you know, I suppose that's, that's what all this work is about is, um, you know, we, <laughs> I actually think we, we, most of us think we're just, you know, kind of such important people living in our important city and that our city will just last forever. And yet, you know, 
it's just such a such a fiction. You know, we we live in such a special point in time, and I think it's just incumbent on all of us to think about, you know, not just where we've come from and what we're doing here today, but but what we're giving to the future. Um, which is why, you know, I've been been such a long time admirer of the work that NYC H two O does. Um, you know, and I and to remind us remind us that we're not the only ones. You know. We, we, we manage the world, we manage our politics as if there was only human beings in the world, as if everything else was secondary and unimportant. But I tell you, these things are just as important as we are. And they are New Yorkers the same way we are. And, um, and we hold all the keys to giving them a good life or a miserable life here with us. And um, I, think we sh I think it's incumbent on us as an issue of justice, as an issue of, um, of giving to the future, um, and as an issue of, of just sheer pleasure and serenity that we need to, to make a life for them as well. And by doing that, that I think we will, um, we will give the skeptical, the intrepid and the creative amongst us and the tree an opportunity to have a wonderful life into the future of New York City. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric, beautiful. Wow, I, I learned so much as always. Um, uh, um, well, I won't, and I, excuse me, I, I don't miss the days of the Mosasaurus. I, I do miss the days of those trees, those tree frogs singing so loudly. I'd much prefer those over the motorcycles. Um, <laughs> or leaf blowers. All right. <laughs> um, there, there are a lot of questions coming in. Um, I saw one just briefly. When do you think your, um, either your atlas or your, your, your new book will come out? Yeah, well, the, the plan is for the Atlas to come out in spring of 2023, which is incumbent on me finishing the manuscript uh, about this time next year. So, so we'll see. <laughs> I'm working on it hard. But I think the Atlas will come first. And then about a year later, I'm aiming for the, for the book. Um, and, you know, just, just a reminder to everybody in terms of their New York City history, you know, 2024 is the 400 year anniversary of the Dutch coming to settle in New York City. You know, Hudson came in 1609, but the um, for the for the 15 years after that, the Dutch would come to trade with the Lenape, but they didn't come here to stay. It was until 1624 that they came to stay. And so I'm sure there'll be a lot of discussion about that. And, um, you know, if you read back to the history in 1924, you know, people had one story to tell about that. I think here in the 21st century, we're going to have a completely different story to tell about the, the moment of colonization of New York City. And, um, and I'm hoping this work can be a part of that. Me too. Um, okay, I'm going. We're going to go to the the Q and A, and <clears throat> um, somebody wrote, uh, "Will your next talk take us back even further?" And I'll just say yes. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I had intended to originally, but I just there was already so much to say about the last sixty five million years <laughs> that I I didn't get back to the you know to the formation of the bedrock. That's another super cool story. And then why the bedrock is here and you know where New York City was before when that happened and so forth and so on. The, 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 my idea for before New York actually is you know to, to start the day before Hudson and go all the way back to the Big Bang and talk about you know eventually even why like the Big Bang is relevant to us living here today. Neat. Okay. Um... Uh, I'm, I'm looking at some questions. I, uh, does the weather affect your mapping? Can you get a sense of the weather um, was over over time? Yeah, for the, for the Wilikia work, for the mapping work, you know, I, I mentioned we do we model disturbance, so we modeled the way the Lanapa use fire, and a little bit, and also their horticulture, and also beaver ponds. Those are the three main kinds of disturbance, and particularly the the, um, the fire, you know, lighting fires is very uh, weather dependent. You know, you, if, there, if there's no rain, your fire's gonna, your fire's gonna burn a lot farther. So um, in our fire model, we actually use the, the tree ring record. There's some nice, um, there's been some really nice work from, by scientists at Lamont Doherty, Earth Observatory at Columbia University, charting the, um, the tree rings in the Hudson River Valley. And there's a composite, composite uh, dendrochronological record that shows drought and drought stress. And so basically we use the, the drought stress and then we match it. We do sort of a, a random sampling based on the Central Park weather record, which actually 
relative to other places, it's quite long. It goes back into the, um, the mid 19th century. And so we use that to try and simulate what the climate was. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, uh, somebody asks, um, when was the town of Ridgewood in Long Island changed to the name to, to Wontog? Um, and that was in the 1860s. Um, I have a reference for that in, in case uh, the person that uh, asked the question wants that. So uh, just a little backstory of that. Um, the Ridgewood Reservoir was called Ridgewood Reservoir because the easternmost source uh, was a town ca called Ridgewood, which was in uh, Nassau County. Um, so uh, after the Ridgewood Reservoir was built, the, 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 the neighborhood around or to the north of, of, of the reservoir became known as Ridgewood. So then you had two Ridgewoods, so it became confusing. So they wound up renaming um, the original uh, Ridgewood in, in Nassau County, Wontog. Anyway, um, so that uh, that answers that. Uh, yeah, that's great. I, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Um, uh, somebody asked, how did you go about reconstructing the old trail system? Yeah, so there's, there's several... Um, Several people have done it before, several scholars, most famously um, Reginald Pelham Bolton in, in 1923, I want to say. The, he, he wrote a book called Indian Paths in the Great Metropolis, where he did a lot of work to, to try and um, reconstruct the paths. Um, there's a map by Kelly that was done as part of the WPA in the 1930s that's in the, um, in the Brooklyn Museum, formerly in the, um, uh, now in the Brooklyn Public Library, formerly in the Brooklyn Museum. Um, Brooklyn Historical Society, sorry. So there's that. Um, also Daniel Pagano, I don't know if you guys know Daniel Pagano, he's the archeologist for the Landmarks Preservation Commission. He has a, in his thesis, he, he also did it. So we, basically what we do is we digitize all of those things. We put them together. We composite, synthesize the ones that are similar to each other. And then we readjust the, to the topography because what we have, which nobody else has ever had is actually a composite historical topography of the city. Um, and so we just make sure that the paths don't run through the middle of a pond or right through the middle of a swamp and that they, you know, that they're kind of reasonable in terms of finding the, the most reasonable place to go up. But like I say, there's no, you know, we don't have any 17th century sources about that. Um, what we have more about 17th century sources is, you know, descriptions of Lape coming, you know, coming from one place to another. And then, you know, we know from the archaeology and the history, a lot of the places that would have been, um, what a lot of the Lenape camps. And obviously some of those were bigger and more important than others um, with more people. And so it makes sense that there would have been a trail going to those, but. So and as a follow-up to that, uh, somebody writes, was the pass through the moraine that the English took during the Battle of Brooklyn, uh, has that been identified? Um, yeah. Y yeah, 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 yeah. That that's pretty well known. Jamaica Pass, where they where they went through during the Battle of Brooklyn, and also the other the other passes, Bedford Pass, and um, and uh, I'm sure somebody on the on the webinar will remember the name of the the pass over by um, Greenwood Cemetery. It's uh, slipping out of my mind right now. But anyway, there there were several passes across um, that they that the, there were several battle several several versions of the battle several that are all well known. And I, I think it's reasonable to think that all of those places were originally Lenape trails. And, and in the same way, a lot of the old roads, you know, you know, the old farm roads that you see on the 19th century maps, probably again, a reasonable presumption is that they followed the Lenape trails and trail system to some extent or another. Gotcha. Uh, just one real quick one, because uh, I think you answered this. Will you expand the Willukia interactive map to include, uh, include the other boroughs? Yes, yes, yes. We're um, trying to raise the money to do that right now, actually. Great. Um, and can you speak about how the, the natural features of uh, Wilikia are still present in New York City today? Yeah, well, um, there's actually some really good work on that. I don't know if folks know the Natural Areas Conservancy. They're um, an NGO that works with the New York City Parks Department, the Natural Resources Group, and they did a ecological assessment several years ago of the natural areas of New York City, a very, <clears throat> you know, very rigorous high level um, scientific sampling to see how the vegetation and soil conditions were doing. Um, and then they've turned that into a couple of plans. There's a forest management framework that they've come out with 
that the Parks Department has adopted. Um, there's a wetlands management framework that's just about to come out that focuses on, on freshwater wetlands, including, including assessments of um, what it's going to take to restore these, these ecosystems on a citywide scale. And they're also working on a trail system. So, so there's actually um, some pretty good work about that. So, um, so yeah, I mean, one of the things I'll be writing about is, is the features that you can still go and see today, as opposed to the ones that you can't go see today and they need to be restored. Um, but I, like I say, I, 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 you know, I mean, I, you, one could of course be always be very critical um, of how destructive some of our ancestors have been um, in the city. But in point of fact, um, there's a lot more here than I think we often give it credit for, particularly in the outer boroughs, if you get outside of Manhattan um, and some really extraordinarily beautiful places. And, um, and, then, and then places like, like this Ridgewood Reservoir, Reservoir spot, which is, um, you know, it's not being used for what it was before. And so now we're, you know, now we're going to bring it back to nature. So, uh, you know, I, 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 there, is, there is this old idea in New York City that like you come to the city, you know, if you're fortunate, you get a good job, you know, you get to enjoy the cultural amenities of the city, you get to go to the Queens Museum, you know, all these wonderful things. Um, but you have to give up nature, like nature is the thing, you know, <laughs> that you have to, you know, you have to leave the city to go and see. And I, I just don't think that's the case. <laughs> I don't think that should be, you know, I think New Yorkers deserve great nature. And we, we actually don't know what the limit is, you know, in the same way that we bring like, a, you know, many New Yorkers bring kind of a limitless ambition to their cultural life, to their business life, to their personal life, you know. Um, I think we need to bring that same level of ambition to the nature of the city and really push boundaries about what's possible here. And I, I actually kind of see that happening. I think that's going to be the big gift of, of this generation uh, to the city in the future. This is what, you know, people 100 years from now will be writing about, about our time, I think. Well, yeah, and somebody asked that, that very question. What do you think uh, the reservoir will look like in 400 years or 4,000 years? <laughs> well, it's up to us, right? <laughs> you know? I mean, it, um, you, you know, the city faces a couple of big issues. Um, you know, one is, one is climate change and sea level rise, right? And I don't think we've really come to grips with that one. And um, that, you know, that is going to rewrite the city, especially the low lying parts of the city. Maybe not the reservoir so much. Um, but I, I think a, a lot about the, you know, the combination of population pressures of people wanting to move to the city and the city itself growing and, and sea level rise and just wonder how the city is going to work, work that self, work it through those problems. Um, but I also think, you know, density is a lot of, a lot of the solution here. Um, I'm, I'm sure the, some of the architects and urban planners who might be listening would agree with this, but, you know, there's such tremendous differences in density across New York City. You know, some Manhattan neighborhoods, there's, well, 65, Manhattan is a, as a, as a county is 65,000 people per square mile. Um, whereas, you know, where I live on City Island in the Bronx, it's about 4,000 people per square mile, right? That's a big difference. That's like one of those big scale differences, you know? So, you know, uh, um, I'm sure my neighbors on City Island would not be pleased to hear me say this, but you know, if some of the neighborhoods would just accept a little bit more density, then that means you could have more people using less of the land base in a way that could then open up more space for nature. And I explored some of these ideas at the end of, um, at the end of Manahata in the last chapter, um, where I produced some, some maps with the same number of people just sort of reorganized in a different combination. And you could free up a lot of land, including coastal retreat with respect to climate change and, um, and still have a really wonderful, in fact, I, would, I actually think an even more wonderful city uh, in the future. Um, and, and somebody uh, you know, asked a question along those lines. Uh, what, how would you uh, envision an ideal landscape for New York City to be more sustainable with the rising sea level? You, you already just started to answer that question. Yeah, I mean, I, we have to deal with this difficult problem that some people, not for any reason of their, not for their own choosing and not through their fault, but they live in places that are, are gonna be flooded in the future and that are dangerous. And so I think society as a whole needs to find a, a way for them to live um, somewhere else. But I also think um, as we make those changes, as we make those big moves, we need to ensure that, you know, everybody has access to, to, to great nature, you know, not just the people that are fortunate enough to, I don't know, live close to Ridgewood Reservoir or close to Pelham Bay Park like me, but, but everybody in the city. And we know that there's such, um, 
an inequitable distribution of, of quality nature across the city, even parkland across the city that needs to be remedied, um, that, that that would be a big part of it. Um, but I also think, you know, there are big moves that need to be made in terms of our energy and transportation systems, um, which is, you know, the this kind of these quest, these things that we're talking about now that are in the in the news about infrastructure, these are really the opportunities to to remake the city in a in a way that um, doesn't just satisfy us today, but actually creates a better city that lasts for a long, much longer time into the future. I, I mean, I hate to self cite, but I <laughs> but I wrote a whole other book about that. You know, uh, the book that came after Manhattan is called Terra Nova: The New World After Oil Cars and Suburbs, and it's it's exactly trying to grapple with this question of you know, given the American landscape and its dependence on the automobiles and, and the oil industry, fossil fuels, how do you imagine and what are the policies um, that would get you to a more sustainable form? And I'll just say that I'm not a big fan of um, government mandates or government restrictions or new rules and laws. I actually think the, the, the main trick, the most important trick is to connect the the ecology and the economy in a in a much more clear in much clearer ways so that that the economy would actually start working for nature instead of only working to destroy nature. Yeah, that would be the most sustainable sustainable thing. Um, so uh, I, I I think the geology is different in Central Park as it is at the reservoir, but perhaps um, you can uh, let us know. So in, in this question. Um, uh, somebody writes, in Central Park, um, on the large bedrock, um, uh, they can see rock scraping. Um, uh, should, uh, sh should we see similar features at the Ridgewood Reservoir or something else? Right, right. So, um, so yeah, those, the, those striations on the rocks in Central Park, and you can see this in the Bronx and Staten Island too. Those are those are actually the that's the glacier marking those rocks, which suggests that you know those rocks were there when the glacier was here. And actually, there's a lot of work that you can look at the angles on the striations on the rock, and you can figure out which direction the glacier was moving across the across the rock, which is kind of cool. Um, but that's right. The bedrock in Manhattan is much closer to the surface, and so that meant that um, during the last glaciation, Manhattan was basically all, all the soil was removed, all the sediments were removed, and it was just bare rock um, at the top. So you wouldn't find um, bedrock at, at the Ridgewood Reservoir, but you would find little bits of rock that have been scraped off other rocks, you know, kind of upstream or up glacier that have been deposited. In fact, I, I meant I didn't, I ran out of time to look at this, but I wanted to go back and look at the excavation history of, of the actual reservoir and to see how much complaining there was about the boulders and so forth, because <laughs> there would have been a lot of rock to move. Um, and and um, and one of the fascinating things about it is it would have been a very diverse set of rocks, right? Because you would have some rocks that would have come from, you know, like from the Palisades in New Jersey, that would have come. You would have had, you know, pieces of granite that would have come out of Connecticut or up in the Hudson River Valley that would have come. Um, the, the typical description of the leavings of, of glaciers is a very heterogeneous mixture of different sizes and different lithologies, different rock types. Um, and they would have had to dig through all that stuff in order to build the reservoir. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because um, as part of our work, uh, we um, have been clearing parts of the wall of the, the reservoir and you can see, and, and, and when they built the reservoir, they lined the, the wall with stone uh, um, and the bottom is lined with clay, but the walls have clay and then stone on top for extra durability. And um, where we have uncovered the, over time, um, the, when, when the reservoir was drained, the, the walls eventually be, got grown over um, uh, by nature and, and covered. So um, in, in these areas that we've, where we've cleared the wall, you could actually um, see the stone of the wall which was gathered just from the natural field stone that they found. Right. You can see the, the rocks do vary. Um, so next time you come out, hopefully uh, we can show you that. That'd be um, awesome. That'd be awesome. Yeah. So we have a, a record there uh, right in the wall of the reservoir. Yeah. Um, but some other questions. Uh, somebody asked, are there Lenapes living in New York City now? There are. There are. There's. Um... Not a lot, but there's a Lenape Center in in downtown in Manhattan, and the, and there's a whole one and there's other ones. I, I don't think I don't think there's not like a 
a register or anything. So I can't tell you exactly how many. Um, but there's also, you know, Lenape people living in New Jersey. And then, and then Lenape people kind of widely scattered. They've definitely had a diaspora. You know, it's a, it's a really kind of awful story. There was, you know, several massacres in the, in the 17th century, um, a lot of broken promises, not surprising given the history of, well, you know, given the history. Um, and then, you know, they were promised land. Some of the Lenape people that were living in New Jersey and, you know, probably from here as well were promised land in the Ohio River Valley. Um, and then after the American Revolution, the American soldiers were given that same land, which then led to a whole series of, of wars, the Shawnee Delaware Wars. The L Delaware is another name for the Lenape. And, and, um, and, um, and then from there, some of them went, walked the Trail of Tears through Kansas and then down to Oklahoma. There's now two Lenape nations in Oklahoma. Others went up into Canada and there's two Lenape nations in Ontario, um, uh, including a lot of, you know, good work to try and recover the language and, and remember the culture and that sort of, that sort of thing. Um, and then there's been a, you know, a whole bunch of different efforts, including the, the public history project that's based out of, out of uh, Rutgers Newark to try and bring the Lenape communities back and together and try and, you know, to deal with this complicated thing, which is that they, they were living here and then they were basically, you know, forced off their land or, you know, there are all these agreements. One, one of the fascinating things about reading the colonial record is that the Dutch were very careful to document everything. Um, and of course, you know, it's not clear at all that the Lenape understood like what this piece of paper, you know, they, they, they didn't read, they, didn't, they weren't a, a literate culture, what this piece of paper meant. Um, and in fact, you know, the early, in the early, very early days, Lenape were fairly welcoming of, of new people coming, but, but, you know, the Dutch came with this idea um, that has then been, you know, uh, changed in America, which is that, you know, you own the land forever as if you can do anything you want with it. And that is such a weird idea. If you think about that, like, what does that mean? What, how can a person who lives 70 or 80 years own something that lasts for literally billions of years forever? I mean, it just doesn't make any sense, right? We all are mortal, we're all gonna die. How can we own something that's gonna last forever? Aren't we always, you know, just stewards of the land? And, you know, indigenous cultures across the world that, you know, have, none of them, ha none of them I've ever come across anyway, have the idea that, that you own the land forever and that you can transfer it just just through these these arrangements, without any respect for the other things that live on the land, and um, yeah, so I don't know. That's that's what I mean. Like I think that's why uh, twenty twenty four is an opportunity for us as a city to think about these things and think them through, and um, and part of that is our relationship to the indigenous people, but I think part of that is also our relationship to the indigenous wildlife and to the indigenous land. You know, full stop in in the the complete sense of the of the word. So true, so true. Yeah, we are, we are, we're stewards of the, of the land um, and, care, and caretakers for future de generations, without a doubt. Um, moving uh, back to the glaciers, there are several questions about the glaciers. Um, uh, one per, uh, I'll ask them in a few parts because yeah. it might be helpful to, um, to craft your answer that way. Someone says that they thought that the Wisconsin glacier extended all the way down to Maryland. And then somebody asks, can you explain how the, the, the glacial situation worked, how, how it moved, what it's doing? Was it retracting? Was it actually moving? Um, th these are all questions that, that people ask. Someone even asked uh, uh, if, if some of those uh, glacier maps are available um, uh, anywhere or the, the, you know, the data sets for them. Yes, uh, so so I, I've never heard the glaciers extended as far south as Mar as modern Maryland. M most of the maps show them, you know, show in this area coming across New York City, like like we talked about, and then going a little bit further south in New Jersey, and then bending back up in New Jersey. Um, and I can, Matt, I can give you some references that you can pass on to folks about if they want to read more. There's the the geologists in New York City have been very active for a very long time about this. And uh, particularly, there's a couple of papers um, by a, a man named Mark Stanford, who works for the New Jersey Department of um, Geology, Geology Department, I guess in their environmental protection group. 
um, which are really, really relevant. He's written some really interesting work where he's trying to synthesize all the different pieces to, to figure out exactly these questions. Where were the different glacial lakes? Where exactly was the moraine at different times? Where were the, um, where were the different ground moraines behind it? Also, there was a man named Les Serkin. I'm not sure he's still alive, but he was a professor at Adelphi University. And particularly for Western Long Island, he was really a great expert and um, worked both on the geologic side, but also on the pollen side. So. So yeah, and so yeah, these glaciers are not like there's just one big chunk of ice that falls out of the sky or something. They're like a river of ice. So basically there's more snow at the north and it keeps pushing to the south. And then the glacier stops and forms a moraine wherever, you know, wherever the, wherever the climate, it melts at the same rate that, that uh, it's coming down, right? And so, so that's why, you know, the climate changes a little bit and the glacier retreats, the climate gets a little colder and a little wetter and the glacier um, goes forward. And so they move there. It's like a, it's like a river, but it's sort of moving slowly. Um, it's, it's heavy and because um, it's made out of ice. And I, you know, water, frozen water is actually a fairly dense substance um, and a fairly powerful one, particularly in mass. And so that's why it's able to move, move boulders, you know, like those, um, like the, the rocks we were talking about before, they're often rounded because they've been bumped against each other and, and like, like kind of like a river, but in a river of ice, if you can imagine. Um, and then, you know, as they retreated, I, you know, I sort of uh, suggested it was sort of an even retreat, but in fact, it was much more halting. It would retreat a little bit, advance a little bit, retreat a little bit, advance a little bit. If, if I was giving a talk about, um, you know, a story, we would be talking about the recessional moraines, as they're called, or if I was talking about City Island, where I live, City Island is a recessional moraine actually created by the by the glaciers, where it you know just stopped for a few hundred years and dumped enough stuff that then made an island on top of the on top of the bedrock. So, yeah, interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of really great work. I, the one, one thing I will say about my geologist colleagues, I, I'm an, I'm trained as an ecologist, so I I come to my geology as an amateur, but um. But the, the reading of the actual literature, the primary literature is pretty heavy going because the vocabulary is very, very dense. Like you really have to like, you know, they refer to chunks of time by names and the, chunk, and the chunks of time by names are often related to the places where those times were first discovered as a geological matter. So, you know, we talk about the Crustaceous and we talk about the Maastrichtian age and the Maastrichtian age, but that refers to someplace in Holland, but it still applies here doesn't have anything to do with you know the Netherlands, but it has everything to do with that chunk of time. Um, so you know it requires a little bit of an investment, but I think it's it's worthwhile. There's a nice book by the Ramos, by Maureen Ramo and her husband Chet, about the geology of the Northeast, which is meant as a part popular introduction to to the geology of this part of the world, which is I find very useful. I, I still I still look at it all the time, even while I'm reading the other stuff. <laughs> I'll use that to help help me get my bearings, because you you know you have to imagine the the landscape in such an expansive way. So you have to know something about the geography, and at the same time, you have to know something about this long geological history um, and the the names and so forth that's associated with it. Um, What's it, what's it called again? I, uh, it's like we'll, Geology we'll, of the Northeast or something like that. Ramo okay. and Ramo. Okay. 1995 or something. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, just two more questions. Was there a relationship between the existing aquifers that you spoke about uh, underneath Long Island and the glaciers? Uh, well, in the, in the sense that, you know, a lot of the water and a lot of the sediment has come from the glaciers. So like when we go to the beach, you know, at the Rockaways, where does that beautiful white sand come from? Thank you, glaciers. That's where it comes from. You know, that was all deposited, and then it's being reworked by the ocean all the time. Um, but some of that, some of that water is older. And like I say, you know, um, Long Island, you know, before we paved paved the place, it was actually quite permeable and had very few streams. Actually, early on in the Wallachia research, I kept thinking I was missing something because you would have all these streams on Manhattan or in the Bronx. And then I would do the same thing for a comparable area in Queens or Brooklyn. And there were so few streams. And, I, and eventually that's part of what led me into reading more about the geological history is to realize that these, these sediments were just so porous um, that the water would just, just go right in. And that actually reminds me a little bit of, um, you know, the Parks Department did a, um, a, a Green Street um, project, you know, where they were building a, a water garden to capture water from a neighborhood. Um, and it turns out they're working with this um, great hydrologist, uh, Franco Montaldo, uh, Montalto from uh, 
Drexel University. Um, and they had it, they had it all censored up um, when Hurricane Irene hit. And I remember Hurricane Irene back in, what was that, 2011, I guess, or 2013. Anyway, it was a huge rain event in the city, not so much wind, but lots and lots of rain. And this one rain garden actually outperformed what it was supposed to do by three times. It put so much water in the, in the ground, it took like all this flooding out of these adjacent neighborhoods and they all went down into this one relatively small area and then just into the ground. And they just, at the time, they just couldn't believe it. And, um, and I, they, that's the, that in certain conversations that, that study is, is trotted out as a as reason why we should have green infrastructure. But you know, I, I think it's really important to remember that that was Queens, and that same thing would not happen in the Bronx because the Bronx, you know, you would put your your green infrastructure in, and it would be bedrock. And there's just unless there's a crack in the bedrock, there's no place for the water to go, and so it's not going to work the same way. So you know, in this in this sense, there you know there are some practical things, putting aside the Mosasaur, for example, <laughs> but there are some practical things that can be learned from this research about how we live in the in the city today and how we manage it. So uh, one of the uh, audience members asks that that lake that you showed in the beginning, the Banzer Lake that was um, um, not far from the reservoir, how, how would that have held water um, if the, um, yeah. Yeah, the same way the reservoir held water by having a impermeable layer of clay underneath it. Right. So that's why the distribution of those ponds is very kind of idiosyncratic. Not every, not every little, you know, divot in the terminal moraine had a pond, only certain ones did. And it's it's super hard to predict because it was just like the, the vagaries of the glacier where it left a little bit of clay versus a little bit of silt, um, you know, different size sediments um, that would allow the, would have held the water in, yeah. And um, as I understand it, um, Sergei Kadinsky has a nice um, blog post about Banzer's Lake. Um, you know, it persisted all the way up until until maybe 1951 or something. Then it was filled in. So, be great if we had it back. Yes, um, there there is a a kind of an, an ephemeral uh, glacial pond um, just to the west of of the reservoir and in, uh, in, in Highland Park. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, so there there's a little bit left. A little remnant. Uh, that's right. That's right. right. Yes. Nature, so, um, nature, nature abides. Yes. So, I, Eric, thank you so much. This was inspiring. I learned so much, uh, as always. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you to Ilana, my colleague from H2O, for facilitating this. Thank you for Catherine for hosting us. And um, uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, we're going to do this again soon. And um, we look forward to, to, to seeing you then. Great. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you all.